are live and recording. I am so excited because we have two amazing authors in the house tonight. Both of these ladies. I am so freaking excited that we have you here. Now, I will give an introduction because you don't really need an introduction because you're loved so well at our store. But we have Charlie Jane Anders and Ellie Bangs in the Mysterious Galaxy house tonight. And I am super, super excited. Just to give you a little bit of information on both of our authors, Charlie Jane Anders is the author of Victories Greater Than Death, which we are celebrating today. And the first, oh, it's the first book in the Young Adult Unstoppable Trilogy, along with the short story collection, Even Greater Mistakes. Her other books include The City in the Middle of the Night and All the Birds in the Sky. Her fiction and journalism have been, have I cannot read today. I am so sorry. Her fiction and journalism have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Slate, McSweeney's, Mother Jones, the Boston Review, Tor, Tin House, Conjunctions, Wired Magazine, and other places. Her TED Talk, Go Ahead, Dream About the Future, got 700 thousand views in its first week. With Annalise Newitz, she co-hosts the podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct. And Ellie Bangs was raised in a new age cult and once rode her bicycle alone from Washington State to the Panama Canal, which I was reading in your bio. And I have to say that's amazing. And how did you do it? And she lives in Seattle where she spends her days fixing machines and her nights writing short stories, novellas, and novels, usually speculative fiction, sci-fi, fantasy, and uncategorized weirdness. So essentially all of the things that we love with a thematic emphasis on longing, heartbreak, and the grim fate of humankind. Her short fiction has appeared in Clark's World, Beneath Ce Ceaseless Skies, Escape Pod, and others. And she's a graduate of Clarion, and we are very good friends with Clarion at the store, so I'm so happy we have a Clarion writer! Now, let's get to, I'm going to give you a little taste of the books. So, Victories Greater Than Death. What I love, I feel like both Victories Greater Than Death and Unity, they both have characters that have something inside of them that is very much moving them in the stories to take action. And in Victories Greater Than Death, we have a protagonist who, once that something inside of her blossoms, let's say, she will meet her destiny. But as we all think, what we think is destiny. Sometimes destiny is not the grandiose, amazing thing we paint it out to be, and it can be a little bit more tricky than we think it is. <laughs> and she has to figure out how to fulfill her amazing destiny, but in the little bit more, you know, tricky fashion. And in Unity, we have a main character who, what is inside of them, I think torturing them a little bit could be the right word. And they are in a city that is not so great and is making it hard for them to become whole again. So they must go on an adventure to get out of the city in a very Mad Max-esque leaving, which is just, I mean, guys, both of these books are amazing. How can you like, what, what? So, okay, I'm gonna stop gushing. Sorry, I'm so excited. I'm just gushing about the books, but you guys are not here to hear me gush. You wanna hear Charlie Jane and Ellie talk. So quick house rules, as everyone knows, we have healed conversation to the right hand side. Please keep sharing all the love and amazingness for our authors. If you look down below where it says, ask a question, that is indeed where you can ask a question. I would highly, highly suggest you take advantage of that because that's the best part of advice. The authors are at your mercy. So pick their author brains with whatever questions you have. And also, you may be wondering, how can I support these authors? How can I support their amazing books? You can purchase them, which I would highly, highly encourage you to do. There is a beautiful buy signed book button down below, and you can get a signed copy of Victories Greater Than Death. And then you can get signed and personalized book plates for Unity, which is absolutely awesome. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to the two of you. I will see you at the end of the event. Have an amazing conversation. Hi, thank you so much Hello. for joining us. It's so good to see you, Ellie. Oh, my God, I love Unity so much. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about it. So, everybody, sorry. I didn't mean to just blaze past. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I was just gonna say I really loved Victory is Greater Than Death. It was just like mm. so fun and so healing and mm. such a great adventure. It made my week. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my God. So Ellie and I were talking before and we decided that we would both read for like five minutes and you know, uh, I'm happy to go first if you want. Do you like whichever you prefer, Ellie? Yeah, why don't uh, you go first? Okay, I'll go first and I'll keep it right at five minutes. It's 7.08 now. And so pretty much all you need to know is that Tina, the main character, she's inherited certain skills from this hero that she used to be in a previous life. And that's kind of the part of the basic plot of the book. And some of the skills she's inherited are combat based. So she finds herself in a situation where she has to use those skills. And I think this, this I'm partly reading this because I feel like it kind of is in dialogue with, with Ellie's book a little bit. Um, Yato clenches at the giant burn mark on their arm, which messes up the elaborate design on their right sleeve. It's fine, they wheeze, closing their eyes to keep the tears locked inside. They just winged me. On the other side of the bulkhead of this thousand year old starship, the Compassion, who are the bad guys, are still shooting at us, making things burst out of, into flames. But I don't know how we get out of this, Yato says. There are just three Compassion soldiers left, and their leader keeps taunting us. We were supposed to be on a nice, easy mission to survey this battle arc from the old seven-pointed seven empire. Me plus Yato, Domini, Kazaya. We were hoping that its records would help us to give us some clue to what we're looking for. Um, skipping ahead a little bit. The four of us have barricaded ourselves inside the engineering section, but there's no other way out. A freestanding workstation bursts into flames just a few feet away from us. What do we do? Kazaya asks. And that's when Yato looks at me. Tina, I'm releasing my sidearm to I'm releasing my sidearm to you. It's up to you now. At last, I think, I'm finally going to see some action. Except that when Yato holds out their positron cloud strike gun to me, I feel a cold weight settle inside me. I've never even touched a gun before, not a real one. Yato sees me hesitating and says, Captain Argentian was a top-ranked markswoman, and you appear to have inherited all of her combat skills. Last chance to surrender, says the compassion leader. You can all die with dignity if you want. Please, Domini says to me, just take the gun already. A beautiful brocaded chair here at the back of this engineering section, which was already kind of moth-eaten, becomes a tall bonfire. The flames spread to the rusted out engineering console. I start to reach out to take the gun but my hand gets stuck. I guess Captain Argentian killed a lot of people, huh? Yato just looks at me like, what do you think? You're dead already, shouts the leader of the Compassion Soldiers. As soon as the grip of the gun in my, is in my hand and I feel the throb of the particles in the cloud chamber, the familiarity sets in. These positron cloud strike weapons are low power but high accuracy and you can shoot them in pre-programmed burst patterns. They fire in a slight curve rather than a straight line. So you have to know how to compensate. I heft the gun for one moment longer while the flames spread around us and the boot steps of the compassion squad move further into the engine chamber where we're trapped. Then I duck out from behind the bulkhead, roll behind the flaming instrument panel, and come up shooting through the wall of flame. The leader of the soldier, the, the enemy soldiers, goes down before he even gets a shot at me, and then I'm diving through the flames in between the other two. Fun fact, the Compassion's Cloud Strike weapons, fire, fire burst weapons, are great for shock and awe, but they're terrible in enclosed spaces, especially when everything is already on fire. Also, they work by exciting the molecules in the targeted area, but you can trick them if you move fast enough, apparently. So, a moment later, I'm surrounded by the dead bodies of all three compassion soldiers. Their eyes are still open, and their snarling faces just look sad now. 
Come on, guys, I say. Time to go back to the ship. You don't want to breathe too much of that smoke. We've gotten all the information we're going to get here. Dominique looks at me and then at the three soldiers that I just shot. Thanks for getting us out of there. That I know that that wasn't easy for you. Nah, it was super easy. I shrug. Once I psyched myself up, now that it's done, I feel sick inside, but I still remember how calm I felt when I was shooting at peace, just letting instinct take over. Kazaya is shivering as he tries to support Yato's weight. It's the same everywhere, he mutters. No matter how advanced people get, we always end up trying to murder each other. I don't know why I bother to leave home. I feel really tired all of a sudden. Like I pulled an all-nighter and then ran a marathon. I guess the adrenaline is wearing off. On the orbital funnel back to the ship, Yato lies there unconscious, and the rest of us just watch the gray hulk of this thousand-year-old starship shrink to nothing. Nobody talks. I sit hunched over, swaying with the motion of the platform. My thoughts are just choppy bits of nonsense. Okay, now it's your turn, Ellie. That is marvelous. I, I love that scene. It's just the action, the characterization. They're both fantastic. Thank you. Oh my God, I love your book so much. So um, my book, Unity, um, is told from a few different perspectives that alternate, um, but most of it essentially revolves around this character, Danai. So I will we'll read the first part of the first bit that is from her perspective. We lay still, clutching each other in the muggy heat of my three by three meter coffin apartment, waiting to see if the world would end. Nauto and I, our complicated friendship transformed by the pressure into a desperate kind of love for as long as it took the news to come in, that Doomsday had been called off again. EPAC and NORPAC were pulling their subs back and their drones to their respective corners of the Pacific, settling back into their stalemate. They were standing down their nanoweapon stockpiles. And in that first deep breath, my whole cluttered mind snapped into a focus as clear and sharp as broken glass. For five years now, I'd been rotting in exile here in the sweltering submarine underbelly of Bloom City. Nothing up on dry land, not the strife and desolation, not the keepers, not even my own guilt scared me more than the prospect of trying to make it through a sixth. So we cleaned ourselves up as best we could. Then we went to meet the mercenary who I hoped would get me out of that claustrophobic city, shepherd me across a thousand kilometers of wasteland and carry what little was left of me home. On second thought, maybe I should go alone. I whispered to Nauto in the elevator up to the lower habitat level. The favor I called in to arrange this meeting isn't worth much. There's a very strong possibility it's a trap. He was still tying back his unkempt black hair. He said, if it's a trap, you might need someone to get you out. He gave me a long look and said, are you sure you're up to this? I have to be, I said. He said, you don't look well. I rolled up the sleeve of my coveralls and stabbed a single use Pascal X injector into my arm and he did the same. Even this short ascent would take us from four atmospheres down to three. I answered, you've never seen me well. His eyes were bloodshot from more than the pressure change when he met mine, and my skin burned with a fresh wave of guilt that he'd spent the whole time we'd known each other watching me slowly fall apart, that we'd likely never see each other again after tomorrow, and that I knew, however well he hid it, how much more he wanted from me than I had to give. In some other world, we could have been simply in love. Maybe we could have been one person. In this universe, I was too broken for the former, and too damned for the latter. The doors reeled open and we tugged our hoods up and put our heads down to walk, past the Medusas guarding the elevator with machetes, on into the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder foot traffic chattering to itself about the ceasefire, past one of Nato's own murals, wherein waves of blue seawater morphed symbolically into yellow-gold fusion energy, onward into the perpetual aquapolitan dusk, thick with moisture and holographic light, to the booth and the smoke bar my contact had named. When I saw the man who sat there waiting for us, I froze. 
What is it? Nato asked, reading my face. Denied? Do you, do you know him? No, it's... What? He said. I shook my head. Working for Medusa Clan, I'd met any number of people who made a career of violence and death. Most of them, like Duke, put more work into the spectacle of their brutality than the brutality itself. They wore necklaces of human molars, swirled their muscles with carcinogenic gene therapies, tattooed their faces, and pierced their bones. But waiting in the glowing smoke was a man who did everything he could to put up a clean facade, but the violence still shone through it. The scars on his scalp couldn't all be combed over. The skin graft around his eye and cheek was seamlessly bonded, but it reflected the wrong shade of brown under the harsh bluish lights here. I shuddered with the instinctive knowledge that the sight of him had been other people's last. But what had stopped me in my tracks, what Naoto struggled to read in my expression wasn't fear. It was an eerie certainty that I had seen this man before. And I had. But I would be very far from Bloom City by the time I realized which eyes I had seen him through. And I think I'll just stop there. Oh my God, that was amazing. Oh my God. I love that book so much. So Ellie, I wanted to ask you, I read in the afterword that you've been working on Unity for 20 years, which is kind of a long time to be working on a book. How, how did, can you just walk me through how it takes 20 years to write a book and how it might've changed as you like, I don't know, transitioned and changed your, you know, went through different life situations and everything. It, it's kind of ridiculous, and I, I'm never going to take 20 years to write a book again. I'm, I'm like, have made up my mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I basically just got the original idea for what became this story when I was in high school, and I was like just writing for the first time, basically, and and also had it going for me that I had no idea how hard it, it and how many years it takes to actually write a book and get it published. So I was like, I'm just going to write a short story about collective consciousness and like publish it and be famous tomorrow. And then I wrote it and was kind of like, oh, well, this is a little, I think this actually wants to be a novella. And then I thought, oh, this may be a novel. And um, by then I was like halfway through my twenties. and um, I just kind of kept at it like very slowly while I was working on other things that I thought were gonna be the thing. Um, so it was really accidental, but it worked out. And, but yeah, my life has changed uh, quite a bit, needless to say, in the years that I've spent writing that book. What was your process like for victories greater than death? I'm curious. You know, it took, it didn't take 20 years, thank goodness, because uh, that would have, you know, that would have been kind of a lot. Uh, it took, you know, it took, I want to say like four years, maybe. Like I started kind of noodling on it in the spring of 2016 when I quit working at io9 and I was working on the city in the middle of the night. And I was just like, well, I'm going to start kind of noodling on the idea of a YA. And pretty much the stuff I wrote in 2016 was just like some of the world building ended up in the book, but it was a very different version of the book. It was just a very different kind of like set of a different, different approach that I kind of, you know, I wrote like a ton of stuff that was just kind of me trying to get stuff. Uh, and then I really started working out it in earnest in like 2017, I think. And, you know, I think I sold it sometime in late 2017 and then handed in a complete draft in 2018 and then was told this isn't a YA book, like in the nicest possible way. And so I had to go back and do like a lot of work to kind of rework, especially the first half of the book to make it feel more YA and to give it that kind of like that urgency and that fast pace and everything. And so it was like, it was a huge learning curve, partly because I was writing YA for the first time, but also it's a, there's so much like world building in, in victories, like just a dozen different alien species and like complicated history and like a lot of technology. I wanted the technology to be all like new and different. So, you know, I thought it was, you know, it was something that took a lot of time. So I wanted to ask you about like, kind of the, the, the thing of like Cartesian dualism, the mind body dualism of like, you know, and like this, this kind of trope, this science fictional trope of, you know, a consciousness that is spread between different bodies, which I think you do a lot of really interesting stuff with in Unity. And, um, you know, and it's, I love, I love your take on it. You know, what, what is so powerful about that trope? Is it something that, you know, a trans person might 
find particularly interesting or meaningful in some way? Oh man, that is an amazing question. Um, <laughs> and I think it's, it's interesting because that's one of the things that I actually didn't get to explore that much in Unity is like, is there an extent to which like part of your mind like is your body and like does, if you have a, a consciousness that you move between bodies, like does that influence your thinking when you're in one or the other? Um, and someday I would like to write a story that actually gets into that. Um, but yeah, like for the purpose of unity, it's just like people are the sum of their memories. And if you can move your memories into another body or share all your memories with them, that kind of just becomes like, you become a single essence with multiple bodies. Um, and I definitely relate to that to an extent in terms of like, the, during the years that I was writing this, I was dealing with my transition and trying to figure out like what it meant to me to have a body, um, let alone like what kind of body I wanted. And um, it definitely felt like there was that dualism, like I was the, a ghost that could teleport into any medium that I really set my mind to. I don't know, does that actually answer your question or? I think it, I mean, it definitely answers, yeah, it kind of, it, it kind of gets at some of what I was getting at. I think it's, you know, it is weird to have a body. It's weird to like have like a physical presence that other people are looking at and can see, you know, whatever they see in, and you know, you can't control how other people perceive you necessarily. And, you know, know, it's just a weird thing. I think it's super weird to have a body. <laughs> You know, that's a good question. I think there might be people out there who are just like, well, we're having a body. It's just what I do. I don't know. That's my like, oh, I have a body. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do kind of, you know, I do try to, to sort of live in my body and like, you know, think of my body as like part of myself, you know, like the gut microbiome is doing some of my thinking for me or whatever. But it's also true that, you know, in some ways it feels like, I don't have the same body I used to exactly. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird that's that you sort of. Something I actually loved in your book is all the bodies that we get to experience when we're traveling through this civilization that has like so many different species that are part of it. And like some of whom are not uh, humanoid at all. And like, just the imagination is so rich in terms of thinking oh, about you. how that affects like what life is like for people with different kinds of bodies, like really different kinds of bodies and how they think. And I just love that detail. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I wanted to make it weird partly because I'm a weird writer and like everything I write ends up being weird one way or the other. And partly because I feel like aliens should be weird alien, you know, non-human, intelligences should be weird and should be kind of like a little, you know, I, and I like the fact that in a space opera like Star Trek or like this book or whatever, you can meet aliens and they, they speak, you can understand them. they they appear to be speaking English, even if they're not speaking English. And like, they have like, you know, you can have like an understanding with them. Whereas I think in real life, if we met aliens, it would just be like, we would be completely lost but I feel like they should be weird and they should have like a very different relationship to their bodies and like to sexuality and to family and to everything else than we do. And I feel like, you know, sometimes I get the feeling that there's like a taboo against giving aliens like really different family structures and sexualities and ideas about romance. But I feel like they should, they should have that. And, you know, so should different groups of, of humans for sure. But, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, I don't know. How did you go about doing the world building in Unity? Like this whole like post-apocalyptic, you know, world with so many, like such a complicated backstory and everything. I just thought about it for a really, really long time. Um, I think when I, when I first started doing the world building and figuring out like, what kind of world is this going to be set in? I was, you know, I was really young and I just thought like, I can just project my mind 150 years forward in the future and imagine like how 
things are going to be screwed up in the future as a result of things that are screwed up now. Um, and I no longer think that I can actually do that. I think whatever future we actually get is going to be really strange and not something we can predict. But, um, but in the meantime, in the time it took me to realize that I'd kind of built this like kind of elaborate situation where um, all of the like advanced cities and things are like in the water or in oceans because that's where you can get algae and plankton and deuterium for fusion power. There are just like so many resources you can get out of the ocean, um, especially if you've completely messed up the surface of the earth. So um, that's kind of where I went with that and aim to not go like too completely dark. I think I tried to create settings where life has really changed, but people have basically adapted to it in really interesting ways. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, needless to say, I adored the world building in Victories Greater Than Death. Um, and, just, Thank like, you. and something I, I also loved is, uh, kind of as you mentioned, um, and sort of to go back to bodies, but kind of not, um, in Star Trek and Star Wars and a lot of these established franchises and whatnot, like kind of just by makeup necessity, the universe is full of aliens that look very, very human. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's never explained at all. And sometimes there's an explanation, um, but without saying what it is and without spoiling anything, I loved that there is an explanation in Victory is Greater Than Death, but it's like not one that I've ever seen or heard of in any other story like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, space opera as a genre tends to be very human centric and like very like, you know, we're the center of the universe. We're like, usually we're the, the coolest and everybody else is just learning from us how to be cool kind of. Like we're going out there and like, we're being like, no, you should stop being dumbasses. And everybody's like, oh, okay. You know, the human explained it to us. Uh, but also it's just, yeah, but everybody looks kind of like us and everybody is kind of like human adjacent and is kind of defined by their proximity to humanness. And I just, I wanted to kind of, like I did a giant thread, Twitter thread about this a while ago about how I wanted to kind of undercut some of the assumptions of space opera in a way that's like hopefully entertaining to someone who, has never really consumed a lot of space opera, but also to people who love space opera. Like I wanted it to be just kind of like, I feel like, you know, as a broader point, I think that when you're taking a genre that has been done a lot and that you love, you kind of have a duty to kind of, to turn some of the assumptions of that genre a little bit sideways and to kind of poke at them a little bit and kind of try to find like the the, the slimy under, growths of that of those assumptions and kind of like just turn them into something weird and beautiful that's brand new and I, you know i'd love to turn that back on you and like the assumptions of like cyberpunk and of like post-apocalyptic fiction like were there things where you were deliberately like okay these are like there are certain kind of assumptions about like how things are going to work in a in a kind of post climate change post-apocalyptic world or in a cyberpunk world with like shared consciousness and all that sort of stuff that you wanted to kind of call into question yeah um there are probably a lot of things but what really jumps to my mind is actually um one of the main point of view characters who kind of tells the story of my book is this mercenary um named alexi who kind of like I, I pl have played all these first person shooter video games and I've seen so many movies and shows where there's like somebody who's really, really good at killing other people um, is like the hero. And there's so many stories like that. And some of them I really enjoy. Um, but I also felt like they, they just year over year, they gave me this overwhelming need to write a character who is really good at killing people, um, but who that's like the worst thing in his life for him, um, who basically just like, his secret power is something that he can't, or not his secret power, but his, his superpower is something that he can't stand to use ever again. Um, and I just really wanted to write a character like that. So that was the big trope that I really wanted to turn on its head. 
Yeah, and I, I'm a big sucker for, you know, that's part of why I read the passage I just read is like, you know, this thing of like, oh yeah, I'm really good at killing people. I'm really good at violence. But, you know, as you can kind of tell from the passage I read, Tina's not feeling great about having to kill those guys. And as the, you know, I didn't get to the part where she really kind of has her, her kind of a meltdown about having to kill those three people who she didn't even really know. And it's like, it's, I feel like killing should be, you know, this horrible, horrible burden, like when you kill and like, you know, um, I feel like it should be this kind of like this thing that people, if you have to do it, A, you should try to find any alternative to killing people, but also B, it shouldn't be like an easy light thing. Like, you know, um, I used J Josh Friedman, who created the Sarah Connor Chronicles, used to say that if you kill someone, you have to go to their funeral. Like basically, like he felt like if you see someone die on screen, if we're just gonna be like, oh yeah, we killed these people, we have to see their funeral. We have to see the people mourning for them. We have to understand that this is a thing. We these people's lives mattered and they've been snuffed out and they're they're no longer with us. And it's just it's this tragic thing. Um, and I, I really loved that about the character of Alexi. I mean, obviously, this is something that I, I like to kind of, you know, that I'm obsessed with in my own stuff and that I really like when people deal with it, like, thoughtfully. Like, you know, the, the character who has committed a lot of violence and really doesn't feel okay about it, you know? I feel like it's actually kind of a big deal. Yeah, and, well, and that was something that I felt like your book handled so eloquently. Uh, yeah. I mean, even in, in the, the very title, like, speaks to that, that your main character or the, the predecessor to your main character is up against someone who is this just kind of space warrior type who measures his success by how much destruction he can wreak. And she's out there facing him saying, like, there are, there are ways to succeed more wildly than that. And, that's yeah. Thank you. Oh my God. Yay. I'm so glad. So should we take some audience questions maybe? Yeah. I was just uh, thinking we got, we got a bunch of questions in the audience. Okay. So. Oh, and uh, you can even vote on which questions you want answered. Ooh, it's like vest question Thunderdome. So <laughs> there's one question which has two votes from Greg. Oh my God, Greg. It's so good to see you. It's so good to like, see your virtual presence. Um, Greg Van, I'm gonna miss mangle the pronunciation of his name, Greg Van Ekot, Ekot, Ekot is like an incredible writer who, you know, wrote uh, um, a series of like Norse themed, you know, um, novels that are just so, so amazing and fun. Okay, so Greg asks, could both authors talk a little bit about the differences in writing YA versus adult other than the ages of the characters? Ellie, have you written YA? I, I should know this, but I, I haven't, but I really want to now more than ever. I and mean, I've been I'm, thinking about it for a while. I've been letting it incubate. How am I going to write a YA story? It's super fun. It's like very freeing. You can have a lot of fun in YA. And like, you know, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, you know, I mean, do you read YA a lot? Yeah, occasionally. Um, well, and what I really acutely feel is I remember what YA fiction was like for me when I was that age. Um, I mean, I certainly <laughs> never stopped reading it because it's often a kind of adventure that's really healing, honestly, when everything is super scary. But um, but I also like those books made my world when I was like a teenager and I would love to be able to do that for someone else. Yeah. I, I really love YA and I feel like YA just has like, you know, YA, I feel like that kind of urgency and that kind of like excitement that you get from a really good YA book and like the kind of the focus, the strong focus on relationships and emotion and on just like, I feel like all fiction is about people trying to figure out who they are and trying to like understand their own identities and kind of reclaim their identities and like really like find ways to be themselves. And, you know, um, and, but I feel like YA 
does more of that and like kind of gets to the heart of that because it's all of sort of coming of age stories. And so you can really zero in on these kind of identity questions that are like in, intrinsic to everything. So I'm, I stand YA and I, I feel like the main difference as someone who has written both YA and adult fiction is that uh, you just, I feel like faster paced, you know, a little bit more emotional intensity, but also the thing that I always say is that you can get more explicitly political and more kind of like openly queer in YA because the, you know, teenagers grew up with like really intense politics and with, you know, queer themes, like they grew up on the internet. And so you can't freak them out by like including queerness and like politics as much, whereas adults are like really easily scared. Adults, you kind of have to hold their hands and be like, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to help you through this. I promise it's not that bad. Cause like adults just, adults are just like very easily alarmed. They're skittish. Yeah. Um, well, and I feel like so much way that I'm familiar with is a lot of it is kind of about the process of figuring out what kind of world you live in as well as who you're going to be inside it. Um, and that is, I guess you don't get to do that so much in, kind of adult fiction, because it's kind of like everyone just has to know what world they're in already. I think that's true, yeah. But... Yeah, so do you want to pick a question? Sure. Uh, it looks like the others have not been voted on, so um, maybe I'll choose one at random. Uh, okay, what is your favorite piece of technology in the world you built? Yay, uh, do you want to answer it first? I, hmm. <laughs> I'm going to go with what technology is. Well, okay, I guess my favorite has to be the, the technology that the whole plot kind of revolves around, um, which is um, the technology for linking people's minds together into a gestalt consciousness. Um, which like begins when it's first invented, it's like a huge clunky box, but then the people who use it uh, are able to expand their cognitive capacities really immensely and develop like ever smaller and more streamlined versions of it until it's something that just kind of lives inside your body and gives you the ability to just kind of directly share information with other people telepathically through that. Um, so yeah, I just had a lot of fun imagining what that would be like and how it can go right and how it can go wrong. And that's kind of the whole book for me. That's awesome. It's such a cool, like, I just, I, mean, I love that. I love that concept and I love how you executed it. For me, I think my favorite technology is probably the every speak because that's the sort of universal translator in my book, in my world that like, just like in Star Trek, you can, you, when you meet aliens, you can understand them. They seem to be speaking, if, you, if you're a, a native English speaker from Earth, they seem to be speaking English. And it's like, you know, so it's very convenient. But I, especially like over the course of the trilogy, I've really gotten to have a lot of fun kind of exploring the concept of what a universal translator really means. What does it mean to translate from like two, very, like, you know, even two different Earth languages have very different like grammar and you know syntax and different assumptions in them. And so what does it mean when you have like a human language and an alien language? How are we really understanding each other? Are we are we really getting the exact meaning of what this other person said? But also the thing with the every speak is it makes sure that you always use the correct pronoun when you're talking to people. Like and that you are actually in the second book I really clarify that it's literally impossible to misgender someone if you're using this translator because it is designed to eliminate misunderstandings and getting someone's gender wrong is is obviously a huge misunderstanding so if you specify in the system that you have she her pronouns the, the there's no way anybody could use any other pronoun for you if they even tried you won't hear it you'll hear the correct pronoun and everybody else around will hear the correct pronoun it's just impossible to misgender someone and that that was something that I was like, oh, that's cool. And it's become kind of a, a thing that I really am like attached to, like, and that I really build on in the second and third books. So great. Do you want to pick a question? Yeah, I saw we had a question from Tessa, which is awesome. 
Because, you know, so Tessa wants to know, Tessa Fisher wants to know, did, writer, did writing get easier after you transitioned for either or both of us? And Tessa says that she knows from her own experience, um, the dialogue Tessa wrote became infinitely more authentic after Tessa was no longer pretending to be someone else. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll jump in first this time. You know, I mean, I transitioned a while ago, let's say. I, I transitioned quite a while ago. And so it's a little hard to untangle, you know, the fact that I have, I kind of leveled up as a writer since I transitioned in various ways that I think I would have leveled up in general. Uh, it's hard to untangle that from my transition. But at the same time, I feel like the process that I went through to figure out my gender identity and to start kind of like putting a better version of myself, a more kind of accurate version of myself, a more proper version of myself out into the world. That process involved a lot of soul searching and a lot of like kind of a little bit of role playing actually and a little bit of like just self actualization. I don't know. And I think that I got more in touch with my emotions as a result of that. And I became better at reading other people's emotions. I'd always had a really hard time with that. And I think that there probably is, it's probably not a coincidence that after I transitioned, I slowly started to get better at writing real character, real interactions and real like emotional moments between people. So I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Ellie. Yeah, I'll echo that. I mean, I think um, one of the first writing teachers I ever had in my life um, told me, and I, I burned it into my notebook, that a writer is only as good as their empathy. Um, and I feel like I just got better at empathizing across the board after or as I went through that. And not because estrogen is a magical empathy drug, but because... Um, it is it? Wait, I want my money back. <laughs> it told me um, it would turn me into Deanna Troy. They were like, just slap on this patch, you'll be Deanna Troy by next week. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, at least I don't think it did for me, but like, you know, it's hard to empathize when you're miserable all the time and repressing all your own emotions. Um, and the more you manage not to be that way, um, the more spoons you have to empathize with other people and like imagine what other people are going through inside. So that was a big thing for me. Oh my God, I Being, love that. Like, that was a misery is the key to creativity is pretty overrated, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't understand this idea that artists are supposed to suffer. I mean, you know, I can think of a few artists that I would like to see suffer, but not because I think it'll make them better at creativity, let's just say. Anyway, moving on. That was, that was a joke, don't worry. I'm not actually going to go out like you know, is the joking. Uh, anyway, so moving on. Uh, is it my turn to choose the question or is it yours? I think it's yours. Oh, it's probably mine. Um, and looks like we've got one that have some votes now. So I'm gonna democracy. What considerations do you have to take into account? And this is from Megan Richards. Um, what considerations do you have to take into account for an adult audience that isn't as open to dipping their toes into queer worlds? How does your approach to the world building or characters change? Should I answer that first or? Yeah, please. Um, I think part of it for me is that I've never been as interested in um, writing characters who are, are queer or trans in the ways that I am as in characters who break the entire concept of gender as we know it. Um, like one of the main protagonists of um, Unity is someone who contains the memories, the combined memories of hundreds of people. Um, so I use a she, her pronoun for her in the book, um, partly because she actually can control her gender identity internally a, a bit and uses that to help her survive. But, um, but like, if you are made up of hundreds of people, like, in what sense do you are? In what sense are you limited by birth assignment or anything even comparable to that? I guess. And yeah, I just love characters who kind of break 
the idea itself. Um, and I always have fun writing them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's an interesting question. I, you, you know, part of the joy of writing or part of the anxiety and the joy of writing is that you don't really get to kind of like choose your audience or you don't get to like be like, well, this one's just for the queer readers or this one's just for the, you know, the, the skittish straight readers. I'm just gonna like, okay. Uh, everything is for everybody really. And like, um, I think that the main thing for me and, you know, my approach has changed over time. Like there was a point back in the early 2000s when I was just writing queer lit and I was writing for a lot of smaller publications that were just like aimed at queer readers and that were like very specifically queer like anthologies and queer kind of themed stuff. And then, you know, when I started kind of writing for a bigger, more varied audience, I really had to kind of think about it and adjust. And I also was like experimenting with different kinds of writing and, you know, maybe less overtly queer themes so I could focus on other stuff that I wanted to focus on. But I feel like the thing for me generally is that A, you know, if the characters are interesting enough, if they're, if the characters feel like, you know, that you can understand their motivations and their kind of relationships, you know, people will generally go with it. Like you, you're not going to get people who are actually homophobic or transphobic or like actually kind of like have like a, a, an antipathy towards queer people. That's not really going to work out. But, you know, if you, but if you have people who are just like not versed in queer communities or not really like, you know, they don't have a degree in queer studies, but the characters are, 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 are understandable and legible on the page and you can kind of like you can root for them the way you would any other character people i think will go with it and a lot of times you know i've increasingly found that the queer themes kind of sneak in in ways that you know just kind of they seep up through the floorboards and like you know sometimes my queerest stories are the ones that are not explicitly on the surface queer they're just like everything about it is like based on a queer experience. And so it's just, I feel like, and also science fiction writers like things that are weird and kind of un, you know, unusual. And so I think that, you know, you can do a lot with that, that people will go with you. But it's also just, you can just never, like, if the story is, is engaging, people will go with you, I think is the short answer. Excellent answer. Oh, so I should pick a, a question. So we have a, yes. one vote for what scene or section brought you the most joy to write? And I think you should answer that first, Ellie. Let me think. I Honestly, it's the sex scene. Um, <laughs> there is one true sex scene in the entire book, but I remember it was it was actually one of the last things I added and like when I started writing this book in high school, I was I did not have the 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 wisdom or the sensitivity or the fortitude to write a really good sex scene and i have actually only gotten into it kind of recently um and it was one of the first that i wrote but i thought like there's going to be a way to take a really interesting approach to this and make it really interesting and like character driven and also hot um and i feel like i pulled that off um at least for my own um perspective. So yeah, that was the funnest part to write. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me, you know, actually some of the romance scenes, like there's like some, there's some romance uh, between Tina and another character in, uh, in Victories. And those were just, I don't know, I had a lot of fun writing those. I, it was like, I got to kind of channel my teenage self a little bit, but also just like the, 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 the way that they connect just made me really happy. It was really, I love writing those two together. I don't know. Yeah, they were so sweet. They just melted me reading those. <laughs> so looks like we have one vote for a question from Leah Wong. Um, okay, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll read that question out because I was already scrolling. Which world or character would you like to write canon for? And I, I'm guessing this means a world or character that's like, already existing like a, a 
you know, which like established world or character would you like to write canon for? Hmm. Like in another, um, an established thing in like another, okay, yeah. Um, like if you were handed the keys to a franchise or whatever. Wow, okay. Off the top of my head, I, I, ooh, I might go with Star Trek. <laughs> Um, just because I've been watching a lot of that recently, um, and DS9 is just like really, I don't know, it's really interesting and engaging, but also like healing to me um, at the end of A Hard Day. And Garrick in particular is my favorite character in the world. And um, okay, but actually I should be what, world or character. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the actor who plays Garrick actually already wrote his own novel about Garrick. Um, so I don't know that I could really add anything, but I selfishly, uh, self-indulgently, if I could choose anything, I would probably write another Garrick novel or something. Or a Garrishir romance, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally want Garrick and Bashir to just like, kiss for 300 pages like basically that's all i want i don't need anything else the plot can be just like them making out you know it's true <laughs> i do love those two i mean i think for me it's kind of a, uh, a choice between doctor who and wonder woman which oh. conveniently are displayed behind me those are the two things excellent answers okay should i pick a question Um, the other upvoted question here is, if you could have total knowledge and complete understanding of one thing, what would it be? <laughs> I guess I'll go first. Uh, death? I don't know. That's a good answer. Um, I feel like my, my brain is giving two completely different directions on this question. One is like, part of me wishes I had complete understanding of like life actually, like, or uh, <laughs> life in the universe, or like, is there a second genesis, or how common is life? Um, what what is life doing on earth for that matter um and then the other side of my brain is just like i want complete and total understanding of pie like i just want to bake the best pies that anyone has ever heard of and just like get them right every time so yeah i selfishly want you to have total mastery of pie so i can come to your house and and eat your pie because Pie is basically the meaning of life, I think, you know? Yeah, you can't go wrong. It's good for the soul. It's, yeah, it's so true. Okay, so we got like time for like one more question, I think, you think? And please do, please do, please do support uh, Mysterious Galaxy. It's an amazing store. It's a wonderful, wonderful store that you should all be supporting. And so there's two questions left. And I think I'm going to choose. Um, I'm going to choose the second one, keeping on the topic of genre fiction, helping playing. So genre fiction helps society evolve by opening up readers minds and giving them a glimpse of possible futures. What are your thoughts about being part of the revolutionary sea change happening right now in both genre fiction and culture? That's that's a really small question. That's like there's that's, uh, you know, I'm going to let you go first. OK, is it still up there? Oh, yeah. Let me think about this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, uh, I'm having kind of overload trying to think of where to begin in answering that, um, because I, I believe probably to a fault in just like how culture, especially honestly, pop culture is kind of like the DNA of society and like what tropes and ideas we throw around and what we assume or learn to think in the process of going through a story as an audience kind of affects like how we see the world. 
Um, and I think giving people glimpses of different futures is a really big way to do that. Um, one of my favorite books ever is about someone who kind of ends up accidentally in contact with two mutually opposed futures. And one is like this kind of anarchist utopia wow. and the other is like this- Woman on the edge of time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, woman sorry, on the edge of time. Yeah. Um, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Like, I'm so sorry. No, that's it. Like that book just kind of like changed my life a little bit and became like kind of a, a, a Bible of sorts for me and thinking about like, thinking about us, like that main character who's here in the present and, but in contact with these two like diametrically opposite futures that always coexist, but like have different like levels of universality in the future, depending on what she does in the present. Um, yeah, I'm really excited you read that. Yeah, I actually, I love that book. I actually got Analia a first edition, a hardcover of that book as a present once because we both love that book so much. It's such an important book. Yeah. You know, I, it's, it's, um, yeah. And Ashley is bringing up Sense8, which actually I feel kind of reminded me a little bit of your book. It kind of covers a lot of the same ground in some ways. You know, I'll give a really quick answer to that incredibly, like, you know, we could, write like an essay each to answer Paul's question. You know, I feel like two things. One, helping people to kind of imagine a, a future in which we survive all of this like stuff and in which we actually build better institutions and stop, you know, having states to answer murder and stuff. And, you know, that would be nice. And doing stuff like helping people to imagine surviving climate change like Ellie does in, in, in Unity. That's like something that I think is really important. But also, um, you know, the thing I talked about earlier about like kind of scraping away the underpinnings of all of these genre tropes that we've come up with, which a lot of which are very imperialist and very kind of like, you know, rooted in this, uh, in this sort of mid 20th century idea of like how the world ought to work. And like the more we can question and kind of decontextualize those things, the better we'll be able to imagine better futures. So that's my like Reader's Digest answer. I think Reader's Support Digest. Yay! Yes, it is now, ladies and gentlemen, my time to shamelessly go tell you to go and buy these amazingly awesome books. Because all I can say is that I don't want this conversation to end because the two of you are such beautiful people and you write such beautiful prose and you are all oh, heard back, but you are, this has been such an amazing conversation. So just a huge thank you to both of you and to our amazing audience. You guys are great as well. Thank you for all of the great questions. Um, I do have one more question for you though, because in the world of publishing, the readers will get their hands on your books and then they will wonder what is coming out next. So are there any sneak peeks you can tell our readers to be keeping their eyes out for? And also where they can follow you on social media so they can stay up to date on everything. Uh, oh, I will go first. first so that we can save the best for last. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I only have Unity coming out, I guess it's out now, um, in terms of novels. Um, but I also have a bunch of short stories out there now. I'm writing more novels. I'm sure I'll get some of them out into the world somehow. Um, and I just announced I have a short story coming to Lightspeed Magazine pretty soon called um, Space Pirate Queen of the Ten Billion Utopias. So I think that might be fun. Um, you Best might title. Oh, that is such a great title. I love that title so much. That's such a great title. Oh my God. Ah, okay, uh, what have I got coming? I've got two more two books coming out this year. It's kind of crazy. I've got, uh, in August, I've got Never Say You Can't Survive, which is a book of advice about how to use creative writing to get through hard times. And then in November, I've got a short story collection called Even Greater Mistakes, coming out like mid-November. And then sometime in 2022, the sequel to Victory is Greater Than Death, which is already written, is coming out. And there's also an adult novel that I'm kind of trying to get into shape right now. So stuff is happening. This is the stuff happening. 
yay yay to all of the things so many things on everyone's end well oh thank you so much for joining us i'm like you can tell i'm stalling i'm like i don't want the event to end because you are so amazing yay. but it is that time everyone where it is now time for us to turn into pumpkins and to bid you all good night yes all of the yay. love and everything for everyone tonight and don't forget go out buy these amazing amazing books victory is greater than death and unity oh. We will see everyone next time. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a lovely evening. Goodbye.